Anyway, it is good to see everyone this morning. If I missed any visitors, I apologize, but it was just good to see these guys this morning, especially Dave. We haven't seen him in a long time. I guess it's just a, I guess it's kind of hard to get from California in here. You're still there, right? So, but it's good to see all of you. Open him this morning. Praise him, praise him. Let's stand and let's sing all three verses. <laughs> Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer, Savior, His wonderful life away. Hail Him, hail Him, hearts are King of glory, strength and honor is His only name. By the shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms, he carries them all along. Praise him, praise him, tell his excellent praises. Praise him, praise him, every joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. He suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail him, hail him, Jesus the crucified. Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrow. The unbounded, wonderful Jesus song. Praise Him, praise Him, that is excellent praise. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer, heavenly Lord, most marvelous and true. Jesus, Savior, reign forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming, of the world victorious. God and glory unto the Lord we long. Praise him, praise him, tell his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Before you sit down, I'm going to be greedy. <laughs> <That's not everybody. laughs> Thank you. 
point. That's it. Otherwise, you get on all my, all my wife and all my sisters. All right, sister, great grandson, so I'm in the second book of this week. Hopefully, I can talk to some great grandson. So we might, we might try and spend part of the money. Because the Lord forced me to meet somebody besides me to talk to.
key words were promised was faith. And what he had what he could do and what he saw. So how that applies to us as Christians. We have faith in the words of our Savior. We have faith in the promise of a holy glory. And it is that faith that brings us here to this table to remember the sacrifice of our risen Savior who gave his life for each and every one of us and for the sins of the whole world. So if we remain faithful, we will join him in glory. What a wonderful thing can happen if we have faith. Communion him is at Calvary. Here's I said to vanity and pride, bearing up my words through and pride. No, we thought it was for me, he died on Calvary. Mercy, there was great grace, was free. Are you there was one to to me? There, my word and soul, my liberty, had Calvary. I have worried, that's what sin I learned, and I've trembled at the highest word. Till my guilty soul and glory turned to Calvary. First, there was great and grace was free. Hard and there was one to fly to me. There, my burden saw my liberty at Calvary. Oh, the new salvation's land. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty God that God did spend at Calvary. Mercy, there was great grace for us free. Our heads on the back to me. There, my burdens all my liberty, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for faith, for the faith that lets us know that there is a place waiting for us. And Father, we thank you for your Son and for your sacrifice there on the cross. Just now, as we take the bread, we ask that you will remember, let us each remember that this represents Jesus' body, that so broken fruits on that tree for each and every one of us. As we partake, Father, let us use this as an uplift for our spiritual bodies. We ask it in Jesus' name. Father, we God, we thank you that we have a faith to the Son, and we have faith in all things, even in the heavenly cross. We thank you, Father, that you have God for us. Share with us about some time and with us. We thank the Father that you have made the Lord inspired by you that we have at our disposal, Father, to learn and to follow and to obey, Father, that we might be saved for eternity. We thank the Father for the Son that you have made the Lord by listening to the Lord and the Savior of the Lord. And then we thank you for this time, this week of time, that was in his blood that comes to us in the kingdom. Ask for forgiveness. Share us now, guide us through the Holy Spirit this day and the coming week. And these things we ask and pray in Christ's name. Amen.
in our prayers for us, but this is a time that we can give back to you. And I'd like to thank you for Saul Hart, because we are Gentiles, and through the grafting of the tree, which is you, we are grafted in. Brownsville Christian Church. That's going to be 
taking place next Sunday. They're having dinner at 12 back in the morning service and have more drinking at 2. So uh, Matt Henry will be bringing that message over there. Matt, he might bring him out and minister a few years ago. So just wanted to be aware of that also. Also, if any of you have trouble with the calling folks coming through your house, some folks have, like to pick up the phone and answer and nothing happens, let me know. I have a couple of that, some others have. And we're looking at them to see why we have those glitches. I think it's working over at the house of the Anonymous. I think. Call oh, yesterday to check up on Mrs. Anonymous. And uh, the voice answered, it wasn't Frank. It said something in Spanish. And uh, I thought I got a hold of the illegal alien here with FG. I said, Mrs. Anonymous was taking a nap and doing it now. So, <laughs> Dean, you might tell that during the, when they answer the calling post, you have to say hello to it. Yeah, you have to speak, you have to, speak to it before it all starts. And if, even if it doesn't, then we'll want to let us know. And if you don't know what to say to it, just say something like, can you hear me now? Try <laughs> to get that thing to work. And, uh, also, someone requested a copy of my Sunday's message and an outline of it. I put a few copies in the back table there, which is a full manuscript of it. Not everything I said, but it's a little basic idea of that. Last week, we spoke about the importance of our words, the impact of our words, and that they have consequences. They, they reveal our heart, they determine our destiny, and they convey values. And when our words are spoken, it reveals to others what our values are. Our values then form our beliefs. Our beliefs will eventually form the law, whether it's the law of our house, law of our community, our state, or name. Then those laws are in place to encourage proper behavior. Then that behavior will form the character of the people that's in submission to the authority of those laws. And then that behavior and character will ultimately determine our eternal destiny. You kind of follow that? Words convey values and beliefs that become law that become the guiding light for our behavior to form our character so that ultimately we know that we are going to reap what we sow. God's not mocked. We've got to answer before the judgment seat of Christ someday. So our ultimate concern is that our behavior and our life be in line with His will, right? So that when we stand before Him, we can hear those words, well done. Good and faithful servant. How many of you know not only does the word of God convey the most important values, but there are other things that convey values, such as bumper stickers. Right? You ever run across interesting bumper stickers? I remember one when I was a kid. It said, You need to buy B U Y buy America. And then mom said, Maybe stand. <laughs> one of the thought right along with that was this is this is be kind of animal month. Go out and kiss a skunk. <laughs> Back in 1990, when I was on the way to a hospital call in Winchester, Virginia, on a bumper sticker, this particular car was Be a hero, save a whale. Save a baby, go to jail. Definitely conveyed some values. And just this last week in Pittsburgh, who thought? First week in October 2012, saw this one on a bumper sticker. It says, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. Put down on the third sign. Those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. And that was by Voltaire. I believe he was a philosopher. I forget where it is in France, but words well spoken. So I kind of stopped at the traffic light and saw that. Wrote it down to this traffic light in Pittsburgh. Eight, 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 Forever. So if you see a bumper sticker in Pittsburgh, don't panic. You'll go to the red light eventually. You're not going to try to write that. Those, those who can get you to believe absurdities will get you to commit atrocities. What if, uh, if there's a shortened version of that? Here's the shortened version of that. If you believe the absurd, you will commit the appropriate. And I want to ask you this morning is there any evidence of that in our society today? Has believing the absurd caused us to commit the atrocious? For instance, the theory of evolution. Has believing the absurdity of evolution caused anyone to commit atrocities? 
How about abortion? Physical body level is your chance, not a baby, it's a defense. How about homosexuality? Alternate lifestyle, right? That's what, that's what it's called, alternate lifestyle. God's word doesn't say it's allowed to be an alternate lifestyle. We can, we uh, in our society condone those things. Many people do. We don't as Christians, but many do. We end up condoning what ought to be condemned. Instead of standing, we sit, which leads me to the text for this morning, the book of Esther, to remind us that we have been placed in the kingdom for such times as these. I don't know how familiar you are with the book of Esther, but it makes a great movie. Actually, I guess they did make a movie about it. I think it's called One Night with the King. I'm not mistaken. Portrait of the Bible story of Esther. The plot is uh, interesting, it's intriguing. Uh, if you like parties, you would have loved living in this time. Uh, the parties weren't godly parties, but they had parties all the time. The king was a Hazarius, the queen was Vashti. You had the good guys and the bad guys. You had the pagans in control. And then you had the Jews, the good guys, who were kind of embodied the situation. And as I said, the Hazarius was the king. Vashti was the queen. And in Esther chapter 1, if you're, if you're looking for party world, Verse 4, verse 5, verse 9. And they had parties. These parties lasted for days. How many of you enjoy parties? Woohoo! Right? These parties went forever. In any occasion, anything that happened, and if it was good, if, they, if it was good news, hey, let's throw a party. And that was basically the atmosphere. However, these parties would also encourage immorality. King Ahasuerus called for Queen Vashti. Chapter 111 said, Hey, I want you to come and display your beauty. Vashti refused. She had some scruples about it. She was a, a woman that had some sobriety, if you please. She had some morals. And she refused to come before the king's command. In essence, says, I will not parade myself before your blessed field cronies. And so Ahasuerus was angry. And in haste, he kicked her out of the queenship. He lost the position because of that. But yet the providence of God steps in and begins to search for another queen because there was a woman by the name of Esther who was being raised by her uncle Mordecai. And Esther, the Bible says, found favor in the king's eyes. And she, a Jewish woman, would become queen. Fast forward to chapter 3, verse 2 through 4. Mordecai, who was a godly man, loyal to God, one who could not be broken and would not bow to any man, Mordecai's morality collides with Haman's power grabbing, egomaniac, murderous arrogance. Haman was a power hungry politician. You know any of those today? He was a power hungry man. He was an egotist, and he was murderous, and he was arrogant. He was coming along the road one day, basically parading himself before the people, and the people were supposed to bow down before him, and Mordecai just stood there. He refused to bow the knee to Haman. Haman was so enraged, this went on day after day, that eventually Haman formed a plot against the Jews, and he wanted to annihilate him. Haman went to King Ahasuerus, and said, I want to kill all the Jews. Basically, there's a people that's not submitted to our law, they need to be destroyed. The king said, Go ahead, do whatever you want. And in this, Mordecai, a Jew, God the man, hears of the plot, and he sends word to Esther, who is now in the king's palace. The king doesn't know that Esther is a Jew, but Mordecai sends word to her and says, in essence, you got to do something. You got to go talk to the king. And Esther said he hasn't invited you. Because their custom was that if you were going to approach the king, and one of the women to approach the king, he had to invite you. And if you went uninvited, if he did not hold out the scepter toward you, you know what that meant? It meant death penalty. It meant more than a fine for a speeding ticket, I'll guarantee you that. It was death penalty if you went uninvited and he didn't accept you in his presence. So Esther said, He hasn't invited me. I want you to look at chapter 4. In verse 14, which is the platform for the message today, to remind ourselves that we are in the kingdom of God for such time as this. In Esther 4, verse 13, let's look at verse 13 first. This is, this is after Mordecai said, you've got to do something, Esther. You've got to talk to the king. And she said, listen, they haven't invited me yet. Mordecai told them, here's what you need to tell Esther. 
Do not imagine that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the Jews. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained loyalty for such a time as this. Let's read that again, that last phrase. Who knows whether you have not attained loyalty for such a time as this. Mordecai is saying, Esther, all the events that led you to be where you are today happened for a reason so that you can do something about this. I've heard over the past several weeks, past several months, okay, past several years, uh, okay, past several decades, <laughs> since I was a kid. Things are bad. Things are awful. Look at the world, look how terrible it is. Get worse. But well, what can we do about it? <laughs> Have you heard that? Anyone? Have you said that? There is something we can do in times such as this. Let's talk about attaining royalty, shall we? Is there anyone in the crowd today who has attained royalty? Well, so, the feeding chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. Have we attained loyalty? If we have, how do we do it? Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 6. Let's look at some New Testament scripture today. One is probably the time. The Bible says that there was a time when we were lost, when we were in darkness. But according to 2 of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 4, God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love for us, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with who? With him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The Bible says we've attained royalty. How do we do it? Because of God's love, because of God's mercy, he offered us a chance, a gift. It's called the invitation of salvation. And by faith, we come to believe in God. In our repentance, we turn from sin. In our confession, we declare that we believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. In baptism, Romans 6 says we are buried, that we die. And thus, in Ephesians 2 here, it says we, we, were, we died. It talks about that, but we were dead. In verse 5, we were dead in our transgressions. The old, the old man was buried with Christ. But something happened. After we were buried, what was it? We were buried with Christ, and what? We were then raised to walk in newness of life. And this is to what Paul refers in Ephesians 2, 4 through 6. That's how we attain loyalty, based on God's mercy and love. We were dead in our sins. We were buried with Christ, and he has made us alive together with Christ. And Christ is our is royalty. And according to 1 Peter chapter 2, and verse 9, and you're welcome to look at that as I go through these points about how we attain royalty. Number two, why? Why did we attain royalty? Peter says that as Christians, you and I, as Christians, as a body of believers, are a royal Christian. Can you say the word royal with me? Royal. We are royalty in the eyes of God because we are now partners with God. Jesus is our brother. The Holy Spirit is our guide. God's Spirit lives within us. And Peter says the reason that we are a royal priesthood is so that we can proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Esther, you've got to say something. Who knows? But would you have attained royalty for such a time as this? Esther, you've got to do some proclaiming to the king. We need some help here. And then... When should we proclaim our royalty to others? The answer to that was another question. When did Esther need to address the situation? A week from then? Two weeks? Three weeks? A month? We'll get to it next year, I promise you. Within three days, she was before the king. She said, okay, let's pray. She fasted and prayed, and she goes, I'll go to the king, and if I die, I die. And within three days, she was before the king in the 
matter started to be resolved. According to Ephesians 5 and verse 16, this, this is actually a sermon I could have well addressed, sort of, or entitled, okay, it is book, chapter, verse, book, chapter, verse. You mathematicians out there and crowd, if you like an equation, here it is. Book plus chapter plus verse equals truth. Assuming one, that, that book is the Bible, so assuming two, that you take the verse in context. Right? Do we live in bad times? How would you describe the times in which we live today? If we were to go on three, I'm not suggesting we do it, but if you want, if I was to go on one, two, three, and ask you to describe in one word the times in which we live, one, two, three, you know, and maybe it isn't bad, evil, awful, wicked. Okay? Great potential, though. These are exciting times. Here's why, even though the times are, here's my description, okay? These are some ways I would describe times in which we live, and whether or not we can do anything about it. Number one, we live in a time in which only 0.1% of the planet knows Christ with the understanding that we teach. So I'm fairly putting those words so that I've not come across as we know it all, we don't, but we have all the truth, and we know we still have, we still have a ways to improve, right? But I want to be a part of a kingdom that is as close to the truth as any kingdom can get. And the church of which I'm a part in this town, in this, in this nation, in this world, that's the one that I have found that is the closest to understanding the scripture in 1 John chapter 2 and verses 1 through 6. When you read that, you'll know what it means to know God. John says, this is how we know that we've come to know him if we keep his commandments. And the one who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But the one who keeps his commandments, in him the love of God has been perfected. And the one who says he abides in him ought to walk as he walked. Turn me down, just like that. That's it. Heard that humming there. I've got some radioactivity on me today. So, that distracts me when it does that, so forgive me, I'll stay on, I'll stay on target here. Point one percent of the planet knows Christ with the understanding that we teach, all right? And I'll tell you what, I'm not too many is that, that's not very many, because I said point one percent. That is one out of a thousand, one out of a thousand understand knowing Christ like we teach it. Hear the gospel, believe in Christ, repent of your sins, confess Christ, be immersed into Christ for forgiveness of your sins, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, be faithful unto death for Christians only, we observe the Lord's Supper every Lord's Day, and we believe in morality. Amen? We believe in morality. You've been following any of the Facebook conversations I've had with others on the internet. I just realized something, by the way, why Facebook is do all those people like it does? We can listen into other people's conversations now and not get in trouble. You remember the telephone in the old days and pick up the party line and listen in, you know, eavesdrop. <coughs> now, now it's just an everyday thing with Facebook. And I made some comments on Facebook and I got this response from one of my acquaintances, a friend on Facebook. And we were talking about our country and, and, and how, how we're going to. Uh, which, which way we're going in regard to politics and this and that. And I mentioned three particular issues that mold my thinking in regard to, to how I live my life and how I choose those that I want to represent me, whether it's here in this church or whether it's abroad as a nation. And I mentioned uh, three particular issues of which I was opposed. And I mentioned two already this morning. I'm opposed to abortion because I believe unborn women have the right to choose life. As well as in the force. I'm opposed to homosexuality, not to converting them. I refuse to condone the sin because we're to be converted from the sin. And these are some of the things I wrote. And I talked some about the redistribution of wealth and our taxes. I am not opposed. Don't go out and say, preacher said we don't have to pay taxes. Because I'm not going to visit you in prison to do that. I didn't say we don't. I'm not opposed to paying taxes. My objection is when I am forced from my taxes to support abortion or other things that I don't agree with. And I just kind of wrote that on Facebook. 
And his friend got back and got said, Oh, I can't believe you what that upsets you about. Then he talked. He talked. I didn't mention the word Democrat or Republican. He did. I didn't. I said, I said, I vote the man. I don't vote the party. I vote the man. Based upon whoever's closest to my life. Right? And then he said this. This is what I want you to hear on this. To prove my point of what I said, 0.1% of the entire panel. One out of a thousand. He goes, well, I know a lot of politicians. He said, I work on the state level, and I work, I know a lot of politicians, even in the national level, and they're all Christians. He said, they just don't have to have any morals. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you'll have to go to Facebook to read my response to that. It's not a sermon on myself. I'm not going to make people read it. Like, There's no such thing as a Christian who doesn't have morals. You know, one out of a thousand. That that's the time in which we live. <clears throat> Number two, we're living in a time in which the people are really wanting to know somebody cares. I was going to mention earlier before I got started, I'll mention it now. It's two weeks, Denise. We're praying for you. The first week, I woke up every morning, that's the first thing I thought of. This week, it wasn't the first thing I thought of. Bill wasn't the first thing that came to mind. But every day of Denise's life, or any widow's life, or any widower's life, it's probably the first thing, whether, whether it was a tragic sudden death or whether it was a long thrown out death by cancer. However, I dare say if you're a widow or a widower, every day you think of it, and probably the first thing when you wake up in the morning you look over it and you think of it, don't you? The rest of us tend to forget that. And I say that publicly now just to remind you all, keep praying. Don't forget to keep praying for ones such as these in times like these. Because people are learning to know who you really care for. Years ago in Tulsa, Oklahoma, a man called the Tulsa, uh, called the, uh, uh, what was the name of the congregation? I believe it's called the Tulsa Church of Christ, when Martin Phillips preached. And he received a phone call from a man in his community who had AIDS, advanced stage of AIDS. He was, he was only weeks away from death. And he said, he asked the preacher, Martin Phillips, he asked me, he said, would I be permitted to attend your worship services? Marvin said, well, of course. Why? He said, I have AIDS. I'm highly contagious. I wear a mask and everything. He said, I'm highly contagious. And Marvin Phillips said, of course you'd be. Yes. He did quite well. He said, wow. He said, every other church I've called, I'm walking around. I'm telling you, this man needed Christ. Unfortunately, he had contracted AIDS with homosexual lifestyle, and now he's paying with his own life. And he's looking for the straight for help. I haven't told the status part yet. Marvin said, oh, yes, of course you can come. So here, let me give you the times of our services. And the man said, that's okay. He said, I don't need to know the times of your services. He said, I would like you to come. He said, because I'm too contagious. He said, I just wanted to know if someone actually cared. I don't know how they went into his home and were able to talk to that man about Christ. But the world is yearning to know that someone actually cares. Remember Jesus and John Wesley wept. Jesus wept. The crowd said, look how he loved him. The others stopped him. Look, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind, could he not have prevented Lazarus from dying? <laughs> they missed the point. Well, sure, he could have kept Lazarus from dying. The point was death would keep Lazarus from living in Christ. And when Jesus wept, some in the crowd took it as good. Others took it as weak. I want you to know tears. Tears of powerful sign of strength and carry and compassion. If someone said, You know this, don't you? People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. I don't know who said that. I wish I'd said that, but I did. Third, we live in times in which the foundation can be destroyed. I mean, you know, the foundation building is important, right? I started putting in the bullet in some of the founding quotes of our fathers. I hope it's a help to you. It comes from www. Wallbuilders with an S dot com. You don't want to put wallbuilder.com because you'll come to a construction site. Okay, maybe <laughs> I don't know, maybe we need walls built. <laughs> but uh, wallbuilders.com, you can find information on the Christian heritage of our country. We're living in times in which they say, oh, you know, our founding fathers, they were a bunch of deists and they didn't know about God. They didn't care about you. You read this about God Adams, the only second president of the United States. 
I think it's a good idea, don't you, to go and act actually what they said to find out the truth. So I hope that's a blessing to you. But we are living in times in which foundations are being destroyed. I'll go on three by you real quick. They all start with the letter F, okay? Foundation of faith, foundation of freedoms, and the foundation of family. Those are three foundations that are being destroyed. Foundation of faith, Bible says in Hebrews 11, that faith is the understanding that the worlds were prepared by the word of God. And that what we see was not made out of that which is visible. That's from Hebrews chapter 11. That proves right there that evolution is impossible. This says that the worlds were framed by the word of God. And that what we see in the physical universe, it wasn't created from other things in the physical universe. Right. God spoke to us. So that, that is the that's the foundation of our faith. And if you want to restore that foundation, here, here's how you do that. You can't do something in times like these. You can study God's word and show you. Study God's word. Because that's where you find truth. Remember, book plus chapter plus verse equals truth. You can go by that, or you can go, you can go by your conjecture, and your opinion, and your feelings. And those are always going to change, but the word of God does not change. Number two. There is the foundation of freedom. And we lost freedom back in the garden of Eden. Genesis chapter 3. And the devil came and said these words. As God said. As God said. He said, oh, we're, yeah, it is over, but we're not allowed to, we're not allowed to eat of this fruit. We'll die. <coughs> Satan calls into question the very word of God. A point on this is basically this. What Jesus said in the New Testament, if you abide in my word, you'll know the truth. And what will the truth do? The truth will set you free. Point. Adam and Eve, if they'd have been satisfied to stay true to the word of God, they would have remained in freedom and never become sin, uh, slaves to sin, like you and I are today. So if they'd been content to simply acknowledge God in all their ways, they, they would not become slaves to sin. The way to answer that today is we want to maintain the foundation of freedom and not forsake the truth like they did. Then we need to keep going back to book, chapter, and verse. And not only read God's word, but also keep holding to it. <laughs> the foundation of family. The foundation of family. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. It's not good for a man to be alone. How many of us do? I say for a man to be alone. One of the reasons you aren't quite good for a man to be alone is when this place is up and we don't have a wife around the day, whatever. Sometimes she's the one that goes. You know what I'm talking about. Seriously, it's not good, he says, God says, for a man to be alone. And you'll notice in Genesis 2, verse 18, God will even invoke chapter verse philosophy, not the conjecture, opinion, feeling. Book chapter 2. God says, I'll make a helper suitable for him. All right? And so the Lord fashioned from that rib, he made a woman that he had taken from man. And Adam, verse 23, said, This is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And for this reason, the man will leave his father and mother. He joins him in wife. And they'll become one flesh. Listen, it is impossible for two fleshes at the same time to become one. It's not alternate, it's abominable. God's word calls it detestable. When you read Leviticus chapter 20, verses 1 through 13 and beyond, if you can take it, it's no. It's not for those who are weak, but are strong, and will accept God's word. If you committed adultery, the adulterer and the adulterer is both to death. You sass your parents, bad mouth your parents, you put to death. If, you, if, a, if a man plays with his daughter in law, it's called incest, and they both were put to death. And if a male plays with a male or female, female, they're both put to death. Now, in the New Testament, here's how you put to death those carnal deeds you allow someone to bury you. Buried in baptism. So you can be raised with Christ and choose the lifestyle that God created originally for. See, the foundations are being destroyed. 
the foundation of family, freedom, the foundation of faith. So what do we do? We pray like Daniel. We refuse to bow the knee like Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, us, otherwise known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We can read with courage like Moses. We can fight the good fight of faith like Joshua, and Paul, and Deborah, and others in the Bible. We can intervene for God's people like Esther, who knew she had been placed in the kingdom for such a time as that. And finally, we can eat healthy. Correct? We can eat healthy. I'll leave you with these three scriptures and words that you do not know what you're thinking. Most of you. Some of you might be headed. Eat healthy? Are you crazy? What are you saying? In times like these, every man's soul has a hunger and a thirst that can never be satisfied unless it receives true food and true drink. Follow me on this. The opportunities we have, that's why I asked you earlier, what kind of times do we live? Oh, it's terrible times. So these are exciting times because with more darkness comes more opportunities to share the light. The opportunities are numerous and numberless before us. And we have the opportunity, using food analogy here, if I may, to dish someone's plate with true food and to fill their glasses with true drink. Because we have been placed in the kingdom for such a time as this. So let's eat. But make sure you're eating healthy and showing others the benefit of a godly diet. We're not talking about health food. We might pick up at those places. We're talking about spiritual health here, in which Christians as food consultants. Did you know that you actually are a food consultant? That's loyalty. Because we know what Jesus said in Matthew 4. We ought to know what he said in John 4. And I hope we know what he said in John 6. So that Paul is this through as we close things down and come to our time of presentation. Food consultants, eating healthy. Jesus said in Matthew 4, 4, man cannot live by bread alone, but from every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In the strongest words he could use, he didn't just say, man shall not live by bread alone. Jesus literally said, man can't live by bread alone. That's why the world doesn't cope, because they don't have Christ. Be ready. So, eat healthy by studying God's Word. That's how we convey <coughs> this truth. Not just by serving the dish to others, but by partaking of it ourselves. How I many of you know it doesn't do much good to throw a Bible verse at somebody if you're not partaking of it yourself? Here, read this. It's good for you. You tried it? Absolutely not. Here, read this. It's good for you. This is real bread here. If you read it, you'll read it. No, absolutely not. But you sure do like no. You gotta partake of the plate before you try to serve the other. The second verse is from John 4, verses 31 to 34. And I can just easily say, we'll pick up reading what Glenn left off in Sunday school this morning. <laughs> you gotta agree with this passage? He stopped right about verse 31. I thought, and I said, I interrupted his class and said, Thank you, Glenn, for not stealing one of my points for first. <laughs> they got back to Jesus and they said, We well, want some food good enough. Um, I, I'm not hungry, I'm ready. And you're like, don't be running food today. He said, I have food you don't know about. He said, my food is to, to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Because that's what his food was. His diet was to do the will of God and to accomplish God's work. I mean, you think that's a pretty good thing that we ought to broadcast to us. To not just serve the dish to others, but also be consumed by that plate, consumed with doing his will and finishing the work he gave us to do. And then finally, John chapter 6, verse 51. I want to, I want to turn to that with you as we come to the uh, beginning of the end, as they say, that one song. John chapter 6, verse 51, Jesus talks about bread. I love bread, don't you? I love baked bread. I pull out that and put that butter on and all that stuff. I'm not talking about physical food. I'm just trying to be mentioning those things because my slide, my, my, it already started just by mentioning that. And if you can mention it, Robert, it's like, hey, 
what I'm trying to convey here is the desire in our hearts that we would create spiritual food and spiritual nourishment like we do with physical food. That we would crave it so much that, that we would want to study God's word. And we would want to do his will and accomplish the work he gave us. And then Jesus in John 6:51, I'm the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he'll live forever. And bread also which I will give to the life of the Lord in my flesh. The Jews began to argue with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? The reason they were arguing is because they didn't understand the difference between physical food and spiritual food. Jesus explained in verse 53 and following. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have what? No life in yourself. He who eats my flesh, drinks my blood, has what? Eternal life. That's why I said earlier, this food of which I speak is a food that gives the benefit of eternal life. Most of the food I eat in the physical realm just adds to my waistline. But this food gives me eternal life. Jesus said, He eats my flesh and drinks my blood. Has, verse 54, has, so if you're a Christian, that's present tense right now, has eternal life. Look what he said, I'll do for you. I will raise him up on the last day. This food has resurrection blessing. Jesus goes on to say in verse 55, For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh, drinks my blood, abides in me, and I in him. And as the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So he who eats me, he also will live because of me. Have any of you had this flesh? This one? Recently? Um, how long ago? 30 minutes ago? We're talking about the Lord's Supper here. This is to what Jesus is referring the flesh, the body, the blood of Jesus. Do you know anyone who missed a meal today? Maybe they missed several meals. They're looking kind of gaunt and thin spiritually. I plead with you this morning do not forsake the assembly. Continue to gather around the table. Because Jesus said, or actually Paul said to Christ, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Winston Churchill said one time in regards to truth, he said, truth is not incontrovertible. Malice may attack it, ignorance may drive it, but in the end, there it is. And brethren, in regard to this table, on which rests the body and the blood of Christ, not literally, but Jesus said, that's my body, that's my blood. The spirit renews. The world may attack him, pagans may deride him, so called Christians may forsake him. But in the end, there he is. There it is. So eat healthy, may be firm and steadfast in constant thoughts and fellowship, break the bread, and pray. Study with diligence, work with purpose, eat healthy in anticipation of his return. By not forsaking the assembly. And while some are still asking, I wonder if we detain royalty for such time as this. I'm here to remind you that we're not asking it here because we know that we have attained royalty for such a time as this. And so let's see the need, respond to the need. If you hear the call, answer the call. And make sure to speak when the call comes. <laughs> if you hear the Lord knocking, as he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open the door, I will come in unto him. I will sup with him. I will dine with him and he with me. If you're knocking at the door, let's be willing to go and open that door and invite Jesus into our presence and allow him to dine with us as we dine with him. So you've heard the, you've heard the word. I hope it's been good for you this morning. Do you believe it, the word? Okay, that's good if you do. Uh, and if you believe the word, that's great. That's great. Will you repent? Will you repent of sin? Well, well I am, and I have a word. Okay, good, good. You repent of your sin. If you've not yet confessed Christ before others, would you do, are you willing to do that? Well, I already have, but if you haven't, we'd like you to do that today. But if you have, have you been immersed in the Christ? Have you been immersed? Would you be willing to do that? Would you like to do that? 
to the state and say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. So some of you already have been first. If you haven't been first, then will you be faithful today in times like this? I am confident that you will. God bless you and bring it to you. Let's stand. Let's just as we are Lord. Just as I am. You'd like to come to Christ? You'd like to be today. Right back here. Anyone? Anyone? Everyone? Father, it is truly a great day this day. 
We live in the greatest country in the world, and we thank you for that. But right now, I know the angels are dancing and jumping and for joy, and so are we inside, some of us. And we thank you so much for Kevin. Kevin was a little scared today, and he asked David to help him out. And if anybody would need any kind of help like that, you just ask. We're always here. We thank you again for your son that died for our sins. And we just thank you for everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <coughs> Here, so you hear back there. We find these chapters very observable. Now, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life, of life in Christ Jesus, has set us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, as it was in the flesh, God did, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, to condemn sin in the flesh. Note that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the mind is set on the flesh of death, but the mind set on the spirit of life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile to the law, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not in the age of peace. And those who are in the flesh do not please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong in And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, and if the spirit is alive, you call it righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to you for the bodies. So, in his spirit, he dwells in So, again, brethren, we are under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if, if by the spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the spirit of God, you shall suffer God. Lost all the days he lost. Also, verse, and I and I spoke in Acts 16. That means for the words of God told the Jews to find him. And now spoke in Acts 16. And now God did not delay the lives of the Gentiles. He was away from sins. He called him on your name. Yeah. 
baker based upon your belief and faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Your sins may be forgiven. You may receive the gift. Now I belong to Jesus, Jesus belongs to me, but for the years of my life, but for eternity. Brother Kevin, tell me. Heavenly Father, we just thank you once again that we have added a new brother. And we thank you, Father, that he's seen the light and now we serve you. Now let us each, as, as the days go on, remember as, when we, as parents and young ones that we need to nurture the Father to help them as he grows spiritually. Just now, Father, as we go our various ways, we ask that you bless us. Bless us as a congregation here. Watch over each of us and keep us. We ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
I don't know either because
like you do the text. Sure. Okay, all right, that's okay. fine. Okay, mm -hmm. and I'll put in there that I can share them so she can okay. put it in her books. Okay, that's fine. Okay. I don't know either. I just. I don't. I just look at it just like she's going to be a very strong young lady. When well, this is all new. Yeah. That's how I look at it. I can't. I can't. Mm -hmm. So, that's. Tell Tammy to come inside. Tell Tammy to come inside. Yes, go out and sit down. Outside? No, in here. It's getting colder out there instead of warmer today. Oh, you can. The only thing I know is you can just be there. And I turned it to mm -hmm. That's become my whole yes. focus mm -hmm. because they need somebody stable. They need somebody. Did she give you a nice seat this morning? If she remembered. What does he have on his hand? It looks like poison ivy, but I don't think so. If it's not itching, it wouldn't be poison ivy. Um, Is it itch? It itches, but it doesn't look like poison ivy. I think it's a reaction. The medicine they gave him for, the, for the pink eye? No, he hasn't got, taken any of that yet. That's right, because the pharmacy is closed. Mm -hmm. Tonight, Bessie, we have CD sermon. Yeah, I saw it. And I told you this is the day. And I think we're going to have three songs to start off. He is exalted. I appreciate what you said today. Oh, great. I thought your message fit perfect. Thank you. I don't think you could have done any better. I did. It went along with Sunday school class. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Just, you know yeah. that? Somebody, say, somebody said something last Sunday night that for such a time as this verse came on. I just need to give out an analogy. If I start a prayer, I'm not giving you the word. And you say, okay, Deans, uh, there's a problem. You've taken over and you give that <laughs> and it, But don't do that when I'm preaching on tithing. Right? Okay. okay, you go back there. You think no. <laughs> That's enough of that. Yeah. It's sad that some people do that. All you do is mention money one time in a year, and they say, that's all you preach about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hope the, uh, they might not. Hey, we're all on camera here if, if you didn't shut off the camera. No. Camera's still going. Ha, <laughs> we're being recorded. Hallelujah. So. But I didn't say anything that 